Hi, in this video is the second of our look at uh, classes within C++. Uh, we're going to delve into the copy constructors, the move constructors, uh, and to look at a little bit more detail about how they, they work. Um, there's probably going to be a little bit of mental gymnastics for this particular um, talk. The, this really part one of a two-parter. The second one will build upon it and then give an example tying everything together at the end. Uh, so as you go through this, th there may be a need to, to pause, to rewind it, to re-listen to some aspects of it, because a lot of the aspects here, th they're, they're important, really are quite important, but they take a little bit of time just getting uh, used to. But we'll see this as we go through. So we're going to start off, certainly in this uh, part one, looking at all of the different options that we have for constructing classes within C++, and the structures we'll look in the second part of the video. There are four different types of constructor within C++, and this compares to two types of constructor within, for example, Java. Uh, you can see the four of them here. Um, all of them are the general name of your class name. We put an argument list coming in. We've got a default constructor, a parameterized constructor. Both Java and C++ have those. But because C++ uses value types as opposed to reference types uh, for creation of our classes or can use, we also then have a move constructor and a copy constructor. And we can do some fairly sophisticated things using those. So it, it will give us some headaches, but equally it also gives us, uh, as the programmer, a lot of control to determine the types of costs that we want to incur in creating our objects. Now, we'll go through each of those. Start off, first of all, with the default constructor, also known as the no argument constructor. Uh, so, default constructor is a constructor that can be called without an argument. There you go. Obviously, there can only be one default constructor. If you had more than one, you couldn't know which one you were going to, to call. Um, in C++, the example at the bottom, you can see that uh, in line one, we're calling the default constructor. In line two, we're also calling the default constructor. But if you're using line one, creating it by value type, you don't have to put in the, uh, the round of brackets, but you do if you're creating it using the new keyword. So it's just a back quirk in terms of how the thing is created. For a parameterized constructor, it's one that takes in parameters. To be more precise, a uh, parameterized constructor has at least one parameter without a default value. And again, it ties in C++. You can pass in default values for your, um, your, 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 your method variables that you're passing in. So you're seeing an example of this, also showing an example of a nice form of construction within C++. So example in this one is for a rational number. Uh, we have two private uh, pieces of class data, numerator and denominator. And inside our public section, we have a parameterized constructor. Text in two parameters, int num and int dem for the denominator. You'll see that on line nine, int dem is equal to one. We are giving it a default value. So I can call this particular constructor, say, passing in 2,3, uh, 4,7, or I could just say three. I could say rational number three. So if I only pass in one parameter, it is assigned to the numerator, and the denominator adopts the default value of one. So that's nice because then it does give us a little bit more flexibility. What's also particularly nice is you can see in lines 10 and lines 11. Now, this is before we get into the body of the actual implementation of the constructor, but rather this is to do with the initial assignment um, of the, the class data that we have within it. So in line 10, what we're effectively saying is the numerator is initialized to the num value that's been passed in, and the denominator is initialized to the dem value that's passed in. This actually saves you a little bit of time. So as opposed to, for example, if, if inside uh, the implementation, as opposed to me saying m numerator is equal to uh, int num, I can actually, when I'm creating the, uh, the num uh, value or, or the numerator value for the actual class, pass in the value that was passed in through the actual constructor itself. So it saves you one additional assignment potentially. But that's, that's your, just your default parameterized constructors. 
we think then about the more difficult ones and we'll go first of all for copy constructors and there's a couple of different types here um, we've got a copy and a copy assignment constructor and they'll differ in terms of the different ways that we have of creating an object that involves some degree of copying from an existing object and what we're thinking about here really is the difference between a copy and a paste so initialization and assignment are two different operations they're related but they do differ so initialization involves the creation of an object that's the key difference if we want to initialize something it assumes we are creating something and then going through a process of giving that created object its default initial values assignment assumes that you really have the object in existence it exists uh, is there and we are assigning we are updating the values by assigning them from some other object um, so both of them involve copying values from one object to the other but only one of them involves the creation of an object the other we assume the object really exists if we want to 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 have a look at this here so you, you can see an example in this one so we've got a and b um, are going to be two objects but we will create we're then going to use assignment. So A is equal to B. Both the objects exist. We're assigning B values in B equal to, uh, or, or to assign those values onto the values in A. Uh, when I said all of A's data members equal to the corresponding member values uh, within B. So it's known as member-wise assignment, that if you have a member called, I don't know, C in the first one, you'll assign it to the member called C in the second one. Uh, example of this one, we have a class called store. Uh, inside this, in our public section, we're declining, uh, declaring uh, two int variables, var1 and var2. Constructor defined at line 5, taking in uh, v1 and v2. And in line 6, you can see there, we're making those initial assignments. So var1 will adopt whatever value v1 takes, and var2 will adopt whatever value v2 takes. And that's our construction of that particular object. The example uh, underneath this, so our method called foo, in line three, we are creating two instances of our store class. Uh, both of them will reside on the stack. A will initially be set to var1 and var2 of 0, 0. B, uh, var1 and var2 will have values 10 and 4. In line four, we are doing A is equal to B, which is another way of saying that look into B, take all of the member variables, var1 and var2, and copy their values across to A, so that A takes on those values. So after we've done uh, execute at line four, uh, var1 of A will be 10 and var2 of A will be four, mapping the values that B had. So, so far, so good. Now, how do we do this? Uh, we need to have um, some way of, of being able to, to assign this, to copy it across. And we'll get on this in a second, I just want to pick up this one here. Um, so in terms of this slide, C++ provides a default memory-wise uh, assignment operator. So you, you get one by default. So all classes will have a default assignment uh, operator built in, the equal symbol. That works by simply copying value for value. Uh, so if it has var1 and a, it'll copy it onto var1 and the other class. Works most of the time. Where it breaks down is that if you have a pointer to some other data, now the default member-wise assignment will copy and duplicate the pointer, but it won't duplicate the data, the thing that it's pointing to. So using the assignment constructor there, you may have two different pointers to the same chunk of data. And maybe that's what you mean. Probably it isn't. Probably you want to, if you're doing that copy assignment, to copy the pointed to data as well. It's a difference between a shallow copy and a deep copy. Um, so if we want to have a deep copy, in most cases we, we probably do want to have a deep copy, we then need to update our assignment operator so that it's capable of doing this. And this then brings us into the original point about, well, how do we do that? Um, we need to have some way of changing how assignment works so that we um, can take into account um, pointers and then duplicate the pointer to data as well. You can do this in C++ by actually overloading the assignment operator. C++ is quite flexible. Uh, in the same way if, if, you know, for example in Java, if I have a class with a two-string method, 
um, I can, through inheritance, I can overload that. I can give my own implementation of the two-string method. I can replace it with uh, something different. I can do exactly the same in C++, but I can also do it for things like assignment. So what we're doing here in the fragment of code, it looks a bit complicated, a bit cumbersome, but we are defining, this would be a method, a con, in this case, a copy assignment constructor, that you would put within one of your files, your header file, that says for this class, this is how it handles assignment, how it does it differently. Let's break it down. So on line one, now we've got a return type and it is a reference to the type of class we're copying. I'll come back to that in a second. So it's so a class of type foo. And normally then you would have just uh, the name of the class for the constructor. But what we're following at this case is operators equal. So we're saying that the foo class wants to change how the assignment operator works. We have to have a parameter and we're passing in here a constant reference to the source. That makes sense. So if we're going to set ourselves equal to something, we need to have the thing we're setting ourselves equal to, the source. We've got a reference to it, so we must always point to it. It's a const reference, so we're not allowed to change it. And that's the right type of protection. So if we do A is equal to B, we shouldn't be allowed to change B because it's unchanged through that assignment. It's only A that changes. Um, so this overloads it. Uh, line three, we can copy from source into all of the variables that we want ourselves. And then line four, we are returning a pointer to ourselves. And this is where the reference to ourself is returned out. The reason we do that is to permit chaining. And you see an example of chaining down at the very bottom where in programming languages you can write A is equal to B is equal to C where C gets copied into B and then the updated values of B gets copied into A. And by having this return, uh, returning a reference to foo and in line four returning reference to ourselves, it gives us a mechanism to support this chaining uh, through its occurrence. Um, may look a bit complex, we'll show you an example of, of how we can use this and hopefully after seeing a few examples it'll make a bit more uh, sense if, if needed. A little aside, um, you, in C++, you can overload any of the operators. You're not simply restricted to the assignment operator. You can see some fragments here. If I wanted to overload, overload the equality or equals to operator, the not equals to, the less than or the increment operator, how I can do that. Uh, and, and again, you're, you're, you've got the freedom to, to change those uh, for any user-defined class in C++. However, remarkably big warning about this. Whilst you can do it, um, and whilst for a copy assignment constructor you in many cases will need to do it, um, you really should avoid overloading anything else. Uh, it's, it's a it's general of thumb, you should avoid overloading operators within classes unless you're 100% sure, not 99, not 90, 9.5, 100% sure. So there's a clear, justifiable and consistent interpretation so that every single person that gets to use your class would understand how the thing's been overloaded and would also expect it to be overloaded. If you don't do that, you're asking for trouble because assignment does have a default operation, a default action, um, as does equality or not equal to or things like that. So you need to be very careful about um, overloading those in classes that they will be consistently and you know, universally interpreted as, as having that piece of functionality. Uh, so that was copy assignment. Related to that, we also have the, the notion of copy construction. This is the idea of initializing a new instance, but using a, an existing instance as, as the default initializer for that. So copy construction enables one object to be created, initialized using the values of another uh, instance of that object. So we have an example here in our foo method. In line three, we're creating an old store class, given a value of 10 and four. In line uh, four, then, we're creating a second one called B. Uh, so again, it'll live in the stack. And into the constructor, we're actually passing in an instance of ourselves. In this case, we're passing in A. And that is, is basically our copy constructor. It says, create a new instance called B, but in initializing this, use the values that A provides you uh, and use that as our way of building up and initializing this other instance. Uh, functionally, it's more or less the same as in line 5. You can see create foo b and then b is equal to a. So more or less the same thing, just bunched together. 
Uh, for how we can do this one here, uh, there's a reasonably simple form for doing it. So again, we've got foo-foo, so we're, we're saying this is in our CPP file. We're providing an implementation of foo's constructor. And what we're passing in here, similar to the copy assignment, we have a const reference to our source. So we're not allowed to change it, modify it. it, it source will remain utterly unchanged through this assignment. It's just the classes we're constructing that will get to be changed. Similar to copy assignment, you have a default copy constructor that you get built in. You don't have to write one. And similar to copy assignment, it'll do a simple pairwise comparison. Works okay unless you have a one of your member variables is a pointer to something else. It will only duplicate the pointer, not duplicate the data that's being pointed to. Um, important bit at the bottom, the copy constructor is called automatically in certain situations. The examples we've shown are being where we, as the programmer, call it directly. But sometimes, based on the operations that we do, there's an implicit call to the copy constructor that can um, actually be triggered. We need to be mindful and, and sometimes cautious about that. Um, as mentioned by default, the copy constructor will perform a member-wise assignment between objects as a shallow copy not a deep copy. Deep copy is one that will copy all of the data that is uh, actually pointed to you as well. And again, iterating down through all of the elements of the hierarchy to make sure we have a complete duplication of the data. Now that's all we want to say by way of introducing our copy assignment and copy constructor. A bit, a bit easier to see when we have an example in the next part, but we'll show illustrations of all of these different types. I want to move on now to, to look at, at this point, the move constructor. Uh, this is something that came in recently, recent in terms of C++. It's a bit specialist in terms of its use. There's, there's one particular region where uh, it, it has quite a good use, but it's there for good reasons in terms of potentially enabling us to write code that is faster, more efficient. Now, this may take a little bit of time just in terms of getting your, your head around uh, we will use uh, the move constructor, say over here, to transfer the ownership of data from one object to another. Now, that's important. We're saying that one object owns or is responsible for looking after a chunk of data. We're going to hand that data over to the other one, not to copy it, but basically to transfer ownership of it. That's the thing we're trying to, to tease out of this. And we'll see an example of what that means. So as such, the data doesn't need to be copied. We're avoiding copying costs here simply by, by sort of doing a reassignment of the data. That'll speed up, in certain cases, our object construction times. A uh, number of specialist uses, including R value assignment. That's primarily what we'll be looking at. So move semantics came in with C++11, fair enough. Now, L values, R values, they're important things to know about. Uh, sometimes they're referred to as a left value and a right value in terms of what side of a, an, a, an expression they can appear on. Better way to think of them. An L value is any value with an accessible memory address. So if I have an integer and I can refer to the address of that integer, so I can access it. I, as the programmer, am able to access its location in memory. It's an L value. An R value is something, anything, that I, as a programmer, cannot access. So these are temporary variables, things that maybe get to be created by way of chaining together a number of operations. I never get to access them directly, uh, but they're used as a temporary storage. They're R values. And R values have the potential of being, they're necessary in terms of a lot of execution, but they have the potential of being wasteful because they have to be created and then disposed of. And we want to be able to do that as efficiently as we possibly can. And that's where move semantics can come into this. So we'll give you a slightly more involved um, decision. So in this one here, we're going to show an illustration of an L value and an R value. And then the next slide, we'll, we'll put in a move constructor to show you what it looks like. Let's have a look at the class container over on the left-hand side. It has, it's basically gonna be a container that points to uh, an integer array. So inside our private members, we have an integer containing the size of the array. Uh, it's an integer array. And in line five, we have a pointer to whereabouts on the heap that array starts at. Fair enough, so that's all it does. 
line uh, eight, we've got a constructor. Now this is minus the constant input, the constant for space, but this is basically the copy, uh, the, the, the copy constructor. So there we are constructing a new container, but we're passing in some other container, some other source container as, as what we want to do. Now this is an example of where we do want to have two completely separate containers that don't share the same underlying chunk of memory on the heap, but both of them point to their own chunk of memory on the heap. So we want to do a deep copy as opposed to a shallow copy. So in line eight, we're saying, okay, we're gonna do a copy uh, constructor. In line nine and line 10, we're giving the default values for size and for data. So in line nine, we're saying that the size of this container, well, it's gonna be the same size as the one we're constructing it from. So we go to the source, we take the size and we make that equal to it. In line 10, we're saying that the data or integer pointer, it should be initialized to the address on the heap of a new chunk of memory, size to be source dot uh, size. So there in line, nine, in line 10, we're doing a couple of things. We're going to, to the heap, allocating a chunk of memory, same size as uh, the source container, and we're setting the address of that new chunk of memory equal to the data uh, member variable of this particular container. In line 11 and line 12, is only one statement, so there were two lines, we are copying then the actual data. So we've constructed this container to have the same amount of storage as the other one. All we've got to do then is to go to the source, to look at the values it has stored in its array and to copy those values into this container too. So at line 13, we will have, uh, after we've done this, we will have made a, an exact duplicate of uh, our source container inside this new one. So well and good, and that, that's, that's a perfectly sensible use of the copy, uh, copy constructor. Let's then move to the right-hand side of the screen. So we've got a method get container that returns a container. We'll use that in a second. We've got our foo method. Inside our foo method, we're passing in a reference to uh, an input container. And the interesting things in line five and line six, we are creating two more containers. One called con one, line five, one called con two and line six. In line five, we're using uh, the constructor we created over in, in the left-hand side of the screen. That's our copy constructor, passing in input. Now input, I can refer to it as an L value. If I want to access and check the size of it, I can go to input.size. So because I can actually... Okay, so as I was saying, uh, line five, it is an L value. I can refer to it directly, so that's fair enough. In line six, we're creating con2, but to do that, we're calling the getContainer method. So the getContainer method returns a container. So this is an actual object that it returns, but I can't, as the programmer, refer to it. It gets to be returned from getContainer, and then, if you like, immediately passed into the constructor when we're constructing con2. So because I can't refer to it, it's an R value. It's known as an R value. So it's a temporary variable that, that I, as a programmer, have no means of accessing, but it has to be created because that's the return type and that's also what this method wants to accept in. Now, important thing, and this is the reason we have uh, move semantics comes into this, that R value, uh, it's gonna have to be created. I'm gonna have to build another container. I'm gonna have to copy the data and that could be a large array. So that could be a fair amount of work involved in doing that. Um, ultimately, when I finish with the temporary variable, it's gonna to have to be discarded and, and got rid of. All of those things take time and effort. And ideally, I don't want to waste time and effort creating temporary variables, particularly if there's a lot of time and effort required to create them, if our array here is big. So move semantics can come in. They give us a way of going to that temporary variable, the R variable, and basically saying, right, okay, so Work had to happen to create you. But when I'm creating con2, I'm not going to duplicate that work. I'm just going to say, okay, you're a temporary variable. You're going to disappear very quickly. You have an array of data. That's the difficult bit. I'm just going to take your array of data. I'm going to, if you like, transfer ownership from you to me because you're a temporary variable. You're going to disappear very quickly. 
So it gives us a way of avoiding one of those copies so we don't have to do more work um, than, strictly speaking, the minimum that we, we need to, to do. So we have an implementation here of a move constructor in this particular slide. And it's down lines 15 to 18, so it's not actually much to it. Um, if you look at line 8, first of all, that is our normal copy constructor. And on line 15, this is our move constructor. The, the difference, other than line 8, you have the const on as well for the copy constructor, but the only difference in line 15 is not going to be const, and we've got two ampersands. That is, is in C++, is a way of denoting that this is a move constructor. Now, you might think, OK, in both cases, you're passing in a container called source, line 8 and line 15. How do you work out which one's called? And this is the thing about these constructors. We, as the programmer, can define it, but we will never explicitly call a move constructor. Instead, well, in, instead, in the types of cases we're looking at here, um, whenever we have an R value, the compiler will be able to look at our class and to go, OK, this is a temporary variable. Here we have a move constructor that's been defined for this class. So presumably, people did a move constructor because it's going to be more efficient than the normal copy constructor. So if it has an R value and if there is a move constructor defined, then the compiler will call the move constructor on our behalf. So it's, it's, it's basically a call that is conditional uh, on A, a move constructor existing, and B, there being an R value. So it'll end up being called in the appropriate situations. Now, boy, a quick recap. Let's just look at the copy constructor. So lines 9 and line 10, we create it, uh, or line, line 9, we copied across the size. Line 10, we created a new array of data. Work had to be done in doing that. Line 11, line 12, we copied all of the data across. Again, work had to be done in doing that. We don't want to do this for a temporary variable because then we are copying across temporary information that's going to disappear. This is where the move constructor comes in. So what do we do? Line 16 in the move constructor. We still set the size of this one to the size of our temporary variable. And line 17, this is a fundamental difference. We're not creating a new array of data. Rather, we're saying that whatever data we point to for this container, let's point to the same data that we did in the other container. So notionally, this is the transfer of ownership. We are pointing to the array that was allocated and set up for the temporary variable. We now take ownership of it. And line 18, we play it safe. So in this particular line, we're going to the source, or temporary variable, and we're going to its pointer, and we're setting it equal to zero, which is the same way of setting it equal to null. So effectively, going to your temporary variable, and we're saying, OK, you used to point to data. Now you're not. We're going to set you to null. So our temporary variable doesn't point to anything. Really key to do that, because what we don't want to end up, and you'll see this when we look at destructors, is that when we get rid of the temporary variable that we accidentally delete the memory that it was uh, pointing to, particularly now that we've transferred ownership of that memory across. But hopefully you can see, having gone through this, that the move constructor gives us a way of not duplicating the copy and the assignment, just directly transferring it across. It's a bit faster. So key takeaway, it only is one for this particular point. Um, C++, if we're thinking about how we can construct objects, we need to be concerned about our copy assignment uh, under just a copy constructor. And in certain instances, we may want to declare a move constructor, particularly if we have a lot of indirect reference data um, and we're using R values as part of, of some aspects of our code calculation. In the next part, we'll go on to look at destructors and then show you an example where we have a class that provides a default, a parameterized a copy assignment, a copy and a move constructor all together in one class alongside with the destructor. <laughs>